and it is a really fascinating company called Licentiart um, that offers services for institutional strengthening of things like um, commercialization of technology, uh, patents, research labs, so helping companies take an idea, figure out whether it's viable from a scientific perspective, um, and then starting to develop it. And Licentiart is based in Colombia. Uh, they started really as a services company and have started to build some pretty powerful intellectual property. Um, and the primary service that they're now offering is the monetization of patents through international platforms. And we have uh, David Hurtado, CEO, with us today. So, David, please welcome. Thank you very much. Hola. Well, uh, I feel like in the Oscar, so I also have a speech. Well, I, I just want to, um, um, I have a dream, by the way, uh, and a speech it doesn't have a copyright. Um, I love uh, how the Canadians speak in English and in French. Also, I will do the same, but in English and in Spanish. Me encanta como los canadienses hacen los discursos en español, en inglés y en francés. So, eh, lo haré también en español. As latinos, we have a passion that we need to share with the world. Como latinos, nosotros tenemos una pasión para compartir con todo el mundo. We are 20 countries with 60, 150 million people. Somos 20 países con 650 millones de personas. More than the European Union, that is 450 million. Más que la Unión Europea, que son 450 millones. Two main languages, Spanish and Portuguese. Dos principales lenguajes, español y portugués. And I believe that a region are ready. Eh, y yo creo firmemente que nuestra región está lista to leap from the exporting Latin commodities to delivering Latin technologies. Para hacer el salto de eh, exportar commodities para entregar tecnologías al mundo. So, eh, this is our role in Licenciarte. Support all Tecnolatinos to be a big force worldwide to export new era of technologies. So, eso es licenciarte, apoyar a los tecnolatinos para exportar tecnologías como una gran fuerza, como todos unidos. And my next big challenge will be to do or to share this dream in Spanish and in Portuguese. Y mi próximo eh, desafío será dar este discurso en español y en portugués, siendo una sola Latinoamérica, being a unique uh, or, or, or Unique Latin America. So the Oscar goes to. I have the honor to uh, introduce our next speaker, or the, the company, OutSystems. In December 2018, OutSystem, a longtime player in the global market for low code development, rise. 360 million in a private equity round that valued the company at well over 1 billion. Portugal based out system was founded in 2001 by current CEO and entrepreneur Paul Rosal. Paul wanted to build and start a startup to solve a problem that customers weren't even aware of 17 years ago. He wanted to allow for rapid development of applications by building a local platform to support that. About Rodson Grieve, our, our speaker, Rodson is Chief Marketing Officer at OutSystems. He has helped the company navigate global growth and the COVID crisis as OutSystems has extended its lead as the number one local company with more than 600K community members, 400 plus partners, 
active customer in 87 countries across 22 industries, and recognition from customers and an analysts. In his 20 plus year career, Rotsom has pioneered a SaaS growth as a scale model as a senior marketing leader in public tech companies. Rotsom? Thank you, that was fantastic, I, I love it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so uh, this is a trip home for me. Uh, I'm actually from Burlington, just down the road. And uh, it was so exciting for me. Uh, I, I, I grew up here, I went to school in Canada at Queens, and uh, when I got out of school, there wasn't a community like this that was really trying to nurture the development of startups to help bring companies from around the world together in Toronto to build new companies and, and nurture new ideas. And so I had to go to San Francisco. I had to go out to, out to the West Coast. And this morning, I got to meet uh, the head of Hall Tech, the, the uh, organization in Halton County that's bringing tech into Halton County, which is a, an amazing resource for, for every startup around here, and the Burlington Economic Development Council. The fact that those things exist today in, uh, in the suburbs of Toronto, I think, are, are, are just incredible to me. And so it's, it's really fun to be home. Uh, I got to San Francisco and uh, got the chance to be a part of a, of a bunch of great growth tech stories. And um, the teams that, that participate in those things and the, and the people that made them happen, I think, were uh, probably the most fascinating part of it. But the process that you go through and the, the way that growth happens is a, is a thing I wanted to talk a, a little bit about today. And, and in, a, in effect, the way that things happen over long periods of time. You know, out systems, as you heard a little bit, I'll talk some more about it, was started more than 20 years ago, and I'll tell you about that, that story. I also got the chance to help a little company called Concur, which uh, when I joined was about, about 20 years old, through an amazing growth cycle, and we ended up selling to SAP for about $8 billion in what was a, a very big early stage cloud transaction. And all of that has left me with a few ideas that I, that I hopefully uh, will, uh, will help you as you think about, about your journey. The other great thing about getting back to Toronto is I get to see my mom. Uh, you know, I think we, we've all gone through these, this uh, last couple of years with, uh, with COVID and been separated from people that, that, uh, that are so, so critical to your life, whether it's family or friends. And uh, about a month ago, I got my, she lives in an assisted living home about a mile and a half from here. And they, I opened up for the first time about a month ago. And I hadn't seen her since... Uh, uh, 2019, I guess, and so to, to get home, I actually have a great excuse on my way to the airport to go see her again today, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's really amazing and fun to have that as, a, as an excuse to get here, too. So, OutSystems. Uh, just very briefly, I want to talk a little bit about OutSystems, just, just to get, ground you in, in the experience we're having. Um, we are the number one low-code platform. Low-code is uh, a, a, one of the things that's really changing enterprise IT departments, and it's shifting them because it allows engineers of all different skill sets to become really powerful full-stack engineers. You know, you don't have to be necessarily an MIT PhD in order to do real computer science. And that, that idea that you can do fast development, it can be high quality, and that you can use this product for really important uh, projects, is really powering a lot, of, a lot of great companies around the world now. And this mission has been, has been going for a while, and it's uh, that moment that, uh, uh, that the billion dollar unicorn round happened was part of a really long and fascinating uh, story. And um, today, it's 87 countries. It's uh, hundreds of partners around the world. There's 600,000 community members. That means people who have they've got certifications, they work in projects for customers, all of these numbers are great. The most interesting part about this slide is, uh, is this uh, founding year, 2001. Uh, probably a, a few people in the room were in like elementary school, 2001. How many people actually were in a startup in 2001? It's a long time ago. It's a long time ago in technology. It's a long time ago in human history. Think of everything that's happened since 2001. And it's a long time ago in, this, in, in the way that unicorns sort of had to have, tend to happen at some times. And it's informed by a bunch of the history uh, and the things that happened around it. It's informed by place, the where it was founded in Portugal. It's informed by a lot of things. But it also has some roots in strategy that, that help 
it become a thing so many years later. Um, we're super proud of, of all of the, the customers that we've got and all the stats around the business, but this, uh, this notion that we've been around for 20, 20 almost 21 years is, is pretty fun. Um, so we looked, I, I was looking up unicorn stats. The average, the average unicorn, uh, the, uh, the average company makes it to unicorn status. Now, this is not the average company, right? We've, we've talked a little about this morning of don't die and, uh, and some of those things. A lot of them do, okay? But the ones that do make it to unicorn make it at about nine and a half years. If you're into math, this is an average that's heavily weighted on the low side. So two, three, four, five years is when a lot of companies are making it to this point. There's very few that go, get to unicorn 18 years out of the gates or 17 years out of the gates. And so nine and a half is kind of this magic number where you, where you momentum happens, a bunch of great things happen, and you've got a unicorn business. Um, not so for us. It's at least double of that. This is um, one of the great things about having a company that's 20 years old is you have amazing pictures. <laughs> so um, most of the people in this, in this picture uh, today don't actually even have hair. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, 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 it's an amazing thing. One of, the, one of the, great, the other great things about this is you see a, fa a failed startup rule. The CEO decided, the guy in the, in the, uh, on the right like that, he decided that we were gonna have a, a shirts and ties at the office at a, as a tech company. And so he tried to force a bunch of developers to show up every day in shirts and ties. You can see he's kind of the last one-ish. <laughs> and uh, probably a few, uh, a few weeks after this picture, he was no longer wearing a tie himself, and I think he only owns T-shirts today. Uh, but this group got together 20 years ago and started on this journey. And this journey, I think, was informed by so much of what, what happened around them. But, it, but there are kernels of truth, I think, that exist inside the story of this company that you can, you, you can take with you wherever you go. We show this timeline. And this, this, is a, this is a timeline you show to investors, right? Your prospect, prospective customers. And it shows all these important events in the company's history. The day we were founded, when we took our first investment in, you know, six years later, when we became a subscription business in 2011. You know, this was a, very, this was a, a big radical change to move to subscription. When uh, a, a, a customer actually signed up and used the product in the cloud for the first time, not in their own data center or in some on-prem facility. These were, the, these were some amazing, amazing events along the way. The part we don't usually talk about is, what, what's on, is, is the, on the other side of this line. 2001, dot-com crash happened, kind of about three weeks after the company was started. In the middle of, like, right after the first investment, global financial crisis happened. Amazing impact on, how that, on all, all kinds of startups, and it had to change the way you thought about the business along the way. And then, of course, you know, a decade later, we come along as a unicorn. And the great news is that that, that momentum has continued. We raised at a, at a, a 9.5 billion valuation uh, last year. And, um, and there's a, uh, an amazing amount of, of history, but there's also experience. And when you see headlines like this one, we're all seeing these, these headlines today. It's hard to not read about what's, what might happen next, right? And it's all, no, it seems like it's all bad. Um, but this is part of the story of almost every company, right? Over time, we all woke up one day about a, two years ago uh, to think that, find out the world was closing down. That was the version of, of a crisis that I think we've been through. That one happened to be uh, uh, interesting fuel for many tech companies to grow, and so it had sort of a, a strange impact on, on the tech industry where we didn't have to go through some of the things we're gonna have to go through next. And so cutting down staff and cutting costs and doing all kinds of things like that we haven't had to confront that. Now we do, in many ways, because the, the, the world is changing in a way that it did in 2001, and then it did in 2008, and all these times when, when we had to just survive. And, and the, the uh, phrase of this morning, don't die, is, uh, is one of the most powerful things that, uh, that you can think of as a company, because this stuff's gonna happen. Um, so there's a few factors that contribute to resiliency, that help you last, help you not die. Um, and uh, from our perspective, we've had a couple of these things that have been the information that has kept us going over time. And as I've looked at the journey of Concur and some of the other businesses that I've had a, had a chance to be a part of, these themes actually exist in these long-term growth stories. And so I want to talk a little bit about, about them. 
The first is find a stable problem. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, about what I mean by, uh, by this and, and how you operate this principle. But the idea that the problem that you're going to solve uh, needs to not be rooted in a specific how. How you're going to do something today is going to be way different when... 5G becomes 6G, when uh, new cloud services are available, everything around you is going to change. But many problems are consistent over time. And so if you can find yourself a stable problem, that's going to give you a chance to evolve a business over a long period of time. Let me see if I can, okay. Here's the thing. Uh, this is, so um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Google's great because you can enter any serious term and then add funny after it and you get something that's useful. Um, humans don't show up at your website, at your company. They don't start reading about you because they want to buy a product, right? There's, people are not motivated to buy products. They're motivated to solve their problems, things that belong to them. The pressure that's coming down from their boss, the, the uh, Eat in the boardroom over the quarter's results, the thing that broke last night that they have to get back alive today. They've got a problem. That problem belongs to them. It's really personal. Uh, the uh, Wi-Fi, do I have Wi-Fi? Uh, this is my, my teenagers uh, drew this probably and put it online. Um, so finding that problem really is gonna, is gonna help, you, uh, help you a ton in your long-term journey. Okay, so here's our, our version of a stable problem. Turns out this is also our mission statement, but it's, uh, it sets up a, 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 a lot of surface area for us to work with because it says uh, who, we're, who we're for and how, what we're kind of do for them. It's really hard to make software. It's really hard to make software at scale. It's really hard to be an innovator and compete with innovative companies. Now, for all of you who are doing startups and you're ruining somebody's traditional industry, congratulations, that's great. There are, there are a, lot of, a lot of companies in the world who are dying to compete, who are trying to figure out how to keep up with Uber, how to get involved in some new way to sell their product, how to build a supplier network globally, all these things they're trying to do. This is a really important problem that has lasted for a long time for us. Everybody wants to become a software innovator. And these are the stories that are creating IP, they're creating uh, enterprise value, and they are giving people really cool jobs and things to do. So this is our stable problem. We have stuck with this for a long time because it puts us in front of the, some of the things that are most important to the people that we talk to every day, the CIOs, the IT leaders, the enterprise architects, the stuff that they're talking about are all rooted in that problem. It's explosive backlogs. They can never keep up with the things that are going on. It's growing complexity. All the stuff that they bought before, how do I make it all work together? What do I do with this new problem that showed up? And then the obvious one of talent shortage. I just can't find enough engineers. All of this is information that we've been able to use over time. And so I would encourage you to continue to think about your business and your, and, uh, and your approach around what's that problem that's going to exist over time. And, and here's... Um, here's what that'll do for you. Having a strong why will allow you to expand your notion of how. You know, in 2001, uh, OutSystems was a, was a little, little company that made a, a thing you, 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 you couldn't even download. It was actually on a CD. Which is really, uh, anyone knows, does anyone, everyone know what that is? Um, but if the idea at that point, if the idea the company was following is we're going to make the best software development studio you can put on a CD and send to somebody, the company would have died a long time ago. Never would have made it. But along the way, if you focus on the why, then all kinds of new hows will show up. The cloud will show up. Subscription will show up. All of these things that have become possibilities over time come out of having a problem that's worthy. And they give you a really way more options over time. They give you a lot more things that you can do for your customers. They also put you very squarely on the side of your customer. They keep you thinking every day, what is that, what's the best way for us to solve this problem on behalf of that person? And so you stop thinking like a product company. This is one of the biggest challenges that I've seen in my 20 plus years in, in, in tech is that, is that we start thinking about product companies and so you think about your, your thing first, right? What's in my box and 
is it getting better or worse relative to some set of priorities you set a while ago and you stop worrying about the person on the other end of the phone or the other end of the email and who's writing the check. If you're thinking about why all the time, it's really easy to stay on your customer's side and to make customer-oriented decisions. The last part about this, though, that I think gets forgotten at times is it gives your people a chance to grow in all kinds of amazing ways. If you are rooted in a set of principles versus a specific set of orders, people can expand their definition of what they do. They can find new ways to solve the problem. They can grow their own skill set to adapt to the problem. So a company with a really strong why, an organization that's really rooted in why are we doing this, is a great place to work because there's always a next job. There's always a, a chance to get promoted. There's always a chance to do something nobody's ever done before. And so this is a set of principles that really I think we're, we're, we're consistent with Concur. Concur was another company that if uh, you've ever done an expense report or uh, booked, a, booked a flight on Concur at some company you've worked at, that was also a company that was born on a, on a CD, you know, and, and in a data center. And there was a time at which they had to just walk away from all that and go tell all the customers, we no longer support that product. We don't do that anymore. And which you think about, you know, 10, 15 years in, go to all your customers and say, we don't make the thing you, you bought. These are big decisions. They end up being great decisions for you, for them, for the, for, and for the market, but they're, they're really hard and you have to have a real root set of beliefs that will get you to the next level as a company. So if you've done all that, the other big thing is scale. But scale can't come without leverage. And this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the lessons that I think the market is, a, is, a, is about to teach a, a, a lot of people because you know, everyone talks about this hockey stick growth, right? And the hockey stick is, a, is this myth, mythical thing that you, Americans, I live in, I'm Canadian, I live in the United States, and they, they talk about hockey sticks, they don't really know what they do um, <laughs> other than cause growth. But the, <laughs> but, the, uh, but the other really interesting thing that comes with a lot of these hockey stick growth companies is their operating expenses are, are, are the same hockey stick, so they just got two hockey sticks. This is not a great long-term way to run your business, and it's not a great long-term way to run your business for, for lots of external reasons, like people want you to be profitable. You know, that's a, uh, that's a um, it's not really a new thing, right? Pe people have had to deliver profitability to their shareholders forever. This is, a, uh, this is just a basic thing we do in business. Sometimes we kind of forget about that for periods and we get snapped back into reality, and we're at that one of those moments where you get snapped into reality. But you, you have a chance through prioritization to go back to, again, make your company easier to work at. If your budget matches your priorities, it's really easy to plan your day. It's really easy to not get too busy. It's really easy to not overextend. And it's really easy to keep people on the same page. And so this idea that budgeting is a, uh, isn't just about shareholders and bottom line, it's actually about employees and employee experience and strategy is, I think, a, a, something that, that will come for a lot of companies in this period. The other big thing that happens is you got to stop doing stuff sometimes. Uh, momentum uh, is one of the most powerful things in business. What I, what I decided to do yesterday, I sort of key, usually keep doing today, plus I then try to do something else. You know, that's so, you get, so your to-do list just grows by one. And the people that work in your organization, all, the, all of the, these intel, incredibly talented people who are type A, ready to go personalities who are gonna check off that to-do list, they do that with you. So they will add that next thing to the to-do list forever. It'll just keep growing and keep growing. And on the other side, you've got this giant to-do list and everybody's kind of confused. And they're not just confused, they've spent too much money, they've spent too much resources. And so declaring that you will stop is really important. Um, it's happened to us at Concur, and we, we were growing globally. We thought global growth, this is really, this is an important thing uh, that, that everybody's got to do. You've got to be a global grower. We opened up an office in Italy. Um, wasn't working very well. <laughs> and rather than just continuing to double down on it and continuing to, to uh, go forward and spend more on it, we faced up this terrible, what seemed like at the time a terrible decision. We we're going to close Italy. It seemed so tragic. We're going to, we, like we're closing a whole country. And uh, almost the moment we did it, we found that we had two Italian speakers sitting in our, our, our Dusseldorf office in Germany who, who were ready to cover that market. And so we had a, another chance for some people to grow. 
we uh, got that, that team then busier, more excited, more committed to the gl- to growth of the company outside of their, just their little patch, and so we made Europe more of, a, more of a contiguous kind of team rather than just an individual set of entities. Stopping can be really healthy. Great for the bottom line, also really good for your people. Um, this is the last thing that I'm gonna say, and, uh, and um, I'm just gonna tell you that this is a, a, a concept that we talk a lot about internally at, uh, at OutSystems. Not everybody calls it a North Star. You, know, you may have a, a, an objective you're trying to get to. But some, it's, sometimes it's revenue, sometimes it's number of customers, sometimes it's uh, retention rate or, uh, or uh, growth of customers. Having a place you're going that's really simple that everybody can get, that is gonna unlock a ton of potential in, in your company and it's gonna last forever. Now you might change that North Star after a while. You might think, okay, we've, we've achieved that revenue number. We're now, we've got found a, that 100 million in ARR. Now we're gonna focus on market share, maybe something like that. You'll, you'll shift around, but having that North Star, having a place you're going is gonna be uh, something that your whole team can share and go with you. And so. Uh, I hope that all of you have a wonderful rest of your day here. I really appreciate the time that you spent uh, with me today. And, uh, um, and I am most thankful actually today for learning about all the resources that are now exist in this economy for you guys. You're very fortunate, you're very lucky to have this, uh, this developing community around you. And, uh, and so congratulations and uh, thank you. <laughs>